It was Tuesday, January 1st, 1936, when the world awoke to the news of the death of King George V. The statement issued at Sandringham House, where the king died, simply said, Death came peacefully to the king at 11.55 p.m. tonight, in the presence of Her Majesty the Queen, the Prince of Wales, the Duke of York, the Princess Royal, and the Duke and Duchess of Kent. George V was 70 years old and was on the throne for over 25 years. In fact, just eight months shy of his death, celebrations were held for a Silver Jubilee. It was the first Silver Jubilee of any British monarch to be celebrated. Born in the midst of the 19th century, during the reign of his grandmother, Queen Victoria, George Frederick Ernest Albert, as his full name was, was not destined to be king. His parents, Albert Edward and Alexandra, the Prince and Princess of Wales, already had a son at the time of his birth in 1865. Albert Victor was George's elder brother and was second in line to the throne behind his father. So no one really thought that George would one day be the one to succeed to the throne. At the age of 12, George began his cadet training on board the HMS Britannia together with his elder brother. Their father thought of the Navy to be the very best possible training for any boy. After years of being educated together, Albert Edward, the second in line to the British Empire, was sent to Trinity College to complete his education. Young George went on to serve in the Royal Navy, enabling him to travel the world. George's life was shattered when in early 1892 his elder brother suddenly died of influenza. Albert's unfortunate death at the age of 28 made George second in line to the throne. This forced him to quit his naval career. A few months later he was created the Duke of York, Earl Iverness and Baron Killarney by Queen Victoria. It would take 18 more years until George would ascend to the throne after the death of his father Edward VII in 1910. George was soon confronted with the outbreak of the First World War in which he was put on opposite sides as his cousin and German Emperor Wilhelm II. As anti-German sentiment rose during the wartime, George felt compelled to change the name of the British Royal House from Saxe Coburg and Gotha to Windsor. Consequently, George and all of his British relatives relinquished their German tiles and styles and adopted British-sounding surnames. Further, George's other cousin, Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, was overthrown in the Russian Revolution of 1917 and set under house arrest. Despite for his plans to offer the Romanov family asylum, worsening conditions for the British people as well as the fear that the revolution might be brought to the UK brought George to forfeit this idea. Nicholas II and his immediate family were murdered a year later by the Bolsheviks. Despite being on the winning side of the First World War, the long years of conflict took its toll on George's health. Years of heavy smoking further worsened George's condition, who in addition suffered from chronic bronchitis. He was frequently forced to go on trips to the Mediterranean. His last trip would take place in 1925. Three years later, George fell ill with sepsis. The illness required drainage and the Prince of Wales took over the duties for the next two years. Despite this, George never fully recovered. His condition worsened when in December 1935 his favorite sister Victoria died at the age of 67. He insisted on attending the whole funeral procession despite recommendations from his doctors to shorten the event. A month later, on January 15, 1936, George complained of a cold and was taken to his room at Sandringham House. He would never leave that room again. George would sweep in and out of consciousness for the next few days. By January 20th, George was close to death. His physician, Lord Dawson of Penn, then made the controversial decision to inject him with three-fourths of grains of morphine. The king then expired at 11.55 p.m. Now the decision Lord Dawson made that very night raises voices up until this day. Did he help the king or was this a murderer? And who even was Lord Dawson? Born on March 9, 1864, as the son of an architect, Dawson enrolled at the University College London in 1879. 
he completed his studies there with a bachelor in science in 1888. He went on to study at the Royal London Hospital where he earned himself his Doctor of Medicine degree in 1893. Dawson first entered the royal circles in 1907 when he became a physician extraordinary to Edward VII. Under George V, Dawson was promoted to physician in ordinary. During the First World War, Dawson served on the Western Front where he rose to the rank of Major General in the Royal Army Medical Corps. After the war, he returned to his previous position at the court of King George V. Now let us return to the night of January 20th, 1936. A bulletin issued by Dawson and the king's other physicians stated that the king's life is moving peacefully towards its close. Most of the information we know today comes from Lord Dawson's personal diary. However, it would take 50 more years after the death of King George V until the truth was made public. In his diary, Dawson writes, At about 11 o'clock, it was evident that the last stage might endure for many hours, unknown to the patient, but little comporting with the dignity and serenity which he so richly merited and which he demanded a brief final scene. Hours of waiting just for the mechanical end when all that is really life has departed only exhausts the onlookers and keeps them so strained that they cannot avail themselves of the solace of thought, communion and prayer. I therefore decided to determine the end and injected myself morphia 3 fourth grams and shortly afterwards cocaine 1 gram into the stended jugular vein. In about one-fourth of an hour, breathing quieter, appearance more placid, physical struggle gone. Lord Dawson made the controversial decision to preserve the king's dignity so that his death could be announced in the morning paper rather than the inappropriate evening papers. Dawson had been a supporter of euthanasia. Euthanasia is the practice of intentionally ending a life to eliminate pain and suffering. Later in 1936, Dawson opposed a move in the House of Lords to legalize it. Now this topic is widely discussed among historians and physicians. I am neither a historian nor a doctor, so I'll just build upon different articles I found. As usual, all sources will be linked in the description box. In an article from The Guardian, Professor John Bryan states that there is no such concept of euthanasia in law to this very day, and what Dawson did was unquestionably murder. Historian Dan Snow has similar words in his History Hit podcast for what happened that night. In its article from November 28, 1986, after the release of Dawson's diary in the New York Times states that Dawson had sped up George V's death. It is safe to say that Lord Dawson clearly knew what he was doing when he injected a lethal dose of morphine and cocaine in the king's veins. That night he advised his wife to inform the Times newspaper to hold back its headline for the death announcement. Dawson in addition acted without the consent of the Queen who was deeply religious and the Prince of Wales. The family agreed that they would not want George V's life prolonged artificially and did not want him to suffer. But it is with no doubt questionable if they would have agreed with what Dawson did that very night. The king died that night with his close family members by his side. Two days after his death, his coffin was moved from Sandringham House to St. Mary Magdalene's Church. The next morning it was brought to Wolferton Railway Station with his sons walking behind the coffin. After arriving at King's Cross Railway Station in London, it was brought to Westminster Abbey. The coffin laid in state there until January 28, 1936, with an estimate of around 800,000 people paying their respect to the late monarch. George V's surviving sons guarded their late father's coffin in what would become known as the Vigil of the Princess. In fact, many of the passing mourners failed to even recognize the four who were dressed in full uniforms. The funeral procession began at 8.45 in the morning of January 28th. George V's coffin was placed on the Royal Navy State Funeral gun carriage which brought it to Paddington Station. There it was loaded onto the train. When the train stopped at Windsor and Eaton Railway Station, the coffin was once again loaded onto a carriage. The last stop now was Windsor Castle, where the funeral service was set to take place. 
As the king's coffin was carried up the chapel stairs, the new king, Edward VIII, and his brothers saluted. The funeral service was held quite simply. It was attended by the king's close family, as well as other monarchs from across the world, many of them who were closely related to George V. The text of the Book of Common Prayers was read, and the hymn, Abide With Me, was sung. George V was firstly buried in the royal vault at Windsor Castle until being transferred to a monumental sarcophagus. Following the death of Queen Mary in 1953, she was laid to rest beside the king. Lord Dawson remained in the royal household after the death of George V. On October 30, 1936, he was advanced in the peerage as Viscount Dawson of Penn. He served during the short reign of Edward VIII and George VI. Dawson died on March 7, 1945, at the age of 80 in London. As the truth was published in 1986, neither Edward VIII, George VI, nor Queen Mary got to know it. When the first volume on the life of Dawson was published in 1950, his widow asked to not mention the night of January 20th, 1936 in it. It was George V's granddaughter, Queen Elizabeth, who was reigning at that time. Her reaction, however, is unknown. The only statement we got from Buckingham Palace was, It happened a long time ago, and all those concerned are dead now. And this marks the end of today's video. I would like to invite you to a discussion in the comments on what you think. Was it a murder or was it justified?